What our children and grandchildren will be able to see when they come out west in the future will be dictated by the battle that's going on right now. And that battle is for the land. Will it be vast landscapes of farmland and ranch land that are protected by the family ranches just doing what they do? Or will it be something like American Prairie Reserve where you get to go see restored plains just like they did 150 years ago with wild roaming herds of bison, elk, mule deer, and all kinds of other plants and animals in an ecosystem that is recreated to look like the Old West? Or will they see the landscape covered by development and windmills that generate electricity so expensive that we have to subsidize it? But today we're going to go to American Prairie Reserve to answer the questions about whether this is a viable option for preserving and protecting part of what we know as the Great American West. So do you call them bison or buffalo? Montana, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and Patagonia is where we still have intact grassland. Our goal in trying to build a 3.2 million acre reserve is... So do you hunt? Whether there was 10 million or 30 million or 60 million, people were removing bison from the landscape. We're headed out now to go see some of the buffalo. What kind of a fence actually keeps in buffalo? You get to a certain age, they're actually just kind of old cranky men. They don't want to do anything. How do you get the buffalo into a corral? <laughs> Anybody can come here 300 soon. We want people to come and enjoy this. Where does the money come from? All right, we're here at the uh, American Prairie National Discovery Center. It's right across the street here in Lewiston, Montana. And we're gonna meet a couple ladies who are gonna take me around and show me what American Prairie is doing. I did. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm Beth? Beth? Yeah. Trinity. Yeah. Good to meet you. Yeah, you too. So do you call them bison or buffalo? Interchange. It's, yeah. I kind of interchange them too because everybody gets upset with me. It's like, <laughs> you call them buffalo. But there's I, a lot of debate over you know, bison versus buffalo. Yes. So I was on the Browning Reservation and a, okay. a friend of mine, uh, Dougie Hall. Okay. So I got him right yeah. there. So, I'm going to call him whatever you call him, yeah. and he said buffalo. buffalo, so I'm going with that most of the time, and then I slip and call him by, so it, it's yeah. just interchangeable, it's the same animal. Yes. How you doing? Trinity. You. Katie. Katie? Yes. And you're going to be helping me? I am. Okay. Showing around today. A lot of times, places like American Prairie and mm -hmm. ranchers or agriculture kind of conflict because they view things in a different way, yeah. but really... What I want to focus on is the 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 common ground of the two of organizations like American Prairie and agriculture all together, or to preserve what we have out here. Now you preserve it by family ranches, family farms, because if just by doing what they do, they keep land from development. They keep land from being overused or overdeveloped because of management practice not all of them but most of them okay and then there's places like america prairie who also preserve land but in a different way they want to see the the wildlife restored to the way it was when lewis and clark came back and you know 150 years ago a lot of people want to see things managed like that and that's part of what they do is help that land so that our children and grandchildren can go see something that we saw that we lived and it's not gone forever. So you're the guy that's in charge of putting bison back or like how many bison go on to a certain area or what do you, what do you? Right, yeah, so I, I lead our bison restoration program. So yeah, everything from uh, working on future plans, strategic uh, direction, things like that, and then lead the team of folks that are on the ground. So what was your name? Uh, Scott Heidebrink. Scott. And he's not going to be able to come with us today, but I just wanted to get kind of his take on what we're doing and, and a little bit about management practices. Right. So what would be the problem with just allowing Buffalo to run wherever they will all the time, as many as they can? Right. I, I mean, number one, social problem. <laughs> uh, there are fences, there are buildings, there are roads, you know, we're not 200 years ago. It's a different place. So we're looking at this in a modern context. What can we do for the land? with what we have, what is presently here. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is those bison regulated themselves or they were regulated somewhat by, by offtake, by harvest. And so uh, we do the same things uh, essentially. So uh, if you don't do that, you're gonna, their things can become degraded, you know, erosion can become a problem. There's any number of problems that can happen. So 
So yeah, management is very important. And, and he's talking about environment. You know, when you talk about environment and then you want to overrun it with grazing animals, it doesn't really, they don't really go together because you can destroy an environment very right. easily with overpopulation of land. Now you said taking the taking of bison or the harvesting of bison in the, mm -hmm. in the days of the Plains Indians, you know, where they, how, there was millions yeah. of them. So you can't think that millions of people wouldn't have an effect on the population of bison, correct? Right. I mean, right. Yeah. I, yeah. Hunting of bison has been a part of bison since they were here. I mean, for 10,000 years, people survived off of bison, whether there was 10 million or 30 million or 60 million, you know, people were removing bison from the landscape. And, uh, you know, we, we see that the same way we want to, we see our bison program as something that people should experience people, you know, get on the ground out with them, see our management, see something on the landscape and experience something with them on the landscape that, that most people haven't for, you know, 200 years. Mm -hmm. There's good managers and there's bad managers mm -hmm. and you can do it with any animal out there. You can do it with elk. You can do it with deer. You can do it with cattle. You can do it with pigs mm -hmm. <laughs> it, and you can do it with bison. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's just as important for us to manage those animals to the right stocking rates, the right places. So we see those impacts on biodiversity. You know, we want to see that heterogeneity of grasses across the landscape. So we see different types of birds. We see different types of plants popping up and that way we can see you know, hopefully some of that diversity that, that may not be in certain areas come back. Right. And I love the way you said this because I, I'm really on this kick right now where we're, we're, I'm talking about managing, uh, people want to manage something with emotion. So they manage an animal at, like for a number, but not the ecosystem. Not, they don't take into consideration the grass, the prairie, the, the landscape, you know, what plants were there, how it looked, what, you know, the water situation, all of those things to come into play or you can't manage something, right? I mean, right. It's, I mean, for me, it's simple. It's not about one thing. It's not about a bird or a certain species of grass. It's about the, the whole. And that, that includes bison, that includes deer, that includes all the plants. It, it includes people too. So, yeah. And that's another thing you have to consider is it does include people. You can't go back to the way it was 200 years ago. We're not going to just wipe off all the people out of the West. Exactly. And the fences and all the buildings and cities and everything. You're not going to do that. So we have to manage what we have right now yeah, exactly. to the best of our ability. So that that takes human thought processes and all of that applies to how your children and grandchildren are going to be able to, what, what they're going to be able to see when they grow up and come out here to the West or if they're not already here. All right. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, no problem. All right, we're gonna head out and see some of their range, some buffalo, some other stuff that they're doing and why they're doing it. So let's go. So I'm with, uh, of course, you met Beth and Katie. Yep. And uh, what do you what do you do for the for uh, American Prairie? I am the senior public relations manager for American Prairie. So you you like take care of people like me. Exactly. Yes. Right. I tour around yeah. you know, with cameras. You're like. <laughs> that guy doesn't know anything, but I'm going to help him out. So what do you do, Katie? I am the Wild Sky Specialist for American Prairie. Um, so I work with all the private landowners in the region that are part of the Wild Sky program. Um, and we do um, kind of an incentive and cost share program that helps with um, to offset the cost of some of the wildlife friendly practices that people are doing. So we'll help pay for a wildlife friendly fence. And then we have a cameras for conservation program that's part of Wild Sky, which um, is super fun to go out and check cameras and work with landowners on getting them set up. Um, and then we have a list of species identified. And if we catch like a mountain lion or a black bear or a coyote, they get a, a payment for basically providing the habitat for the species that are utilizing their place. I see. Yeah. Now this is an important question to people. Where does the money come from for programs like the the camera thing for supplying habitat for buffalo for all of the stuff that you're doing? Where does that money come from? We are a nonprofit, and so we are supported by philanthropy. So we don't receive federal funding. We don't receive taxpayer dollars. It's all from private individuals um, giving donations. So anybody can give a donation to this? I mean, is it? Yes, please. Yeah. That's <laughs> anybody I mean. can give. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yep. 
and you know we're really proud of the fact that we've raised a lot of money in the 21 plus year history of American Prairie um, and we've got broad support from Montanans from um, people all over the country and um, it's been really successful I think that there's something about this project that people get excited about because it feels so audacious it feels <laughs> it's really ambitious you know trying to uh, create a, a place for wildlife and people that's over three million acres granted a lot of that is existing public land but when we sort of explain the reason why behind people go oh yeah that makes sense you know grasslands are um, the least protected biome on the planet there are only four places the other question we get is why why here why montana why central montana well there the great plains are one of the last four remaining places on the planet where we, there's this large scale landscape conservation is still possible and that's because there's so much existing intact grassland currently here that hasn't been plowed up that hasn't been developed so as a native montanan that i just i feel really proud that working on a project that's helping to conserve something that is unlike most other places. It's Montana, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and Patagonia is where we still have intact grassland of this size and scale. So where are we headed first? Uh, we are gonna go to our Sun Prairie unit, which is home to our largest bison herd. We have a total of about 800 bison. Uh, they're split between three different units. And I believe right now there's about 300 um, in the herd that's on Sun Prairie. Okay. It's about two and a half hours north of uh, Lewistown. Okay. Great. Sounds awesome. It's a Montana roadblock. <laughs> Standoff. Standoff. This is. These are. These are Red Angus cows, yep. and apparently that that's a good spot. To, I think they're trying to get to wherever they are supposed to either go later. Usually these are young cows here. Yeah. These are probably yearlings. So <laughs> they're trying to go somewhere, but the, the cattle guard is blocking them and they're just waiting for somebody to let them across. Yeah. I think. Let's see if they... And how you do this, how you go through this is not wait here. You, go, you just gotta push them out of the way just very slightly and hope they don't kick your vehicle. Mm -hmm. There you go. Come on, cows. Move out of the way. There you go. Not feet Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's just backing up. You gotta go to the side. The side. There you go. Angle. Angle away. See you guys later. So how many miles on this gravel road do we have to go? Uh, about 50. So we turned off a of highway 191 onto what's called Dry Fork Road. So we'll take this in, it's about 50 miles of gravel, to our Sun Prairie unit where the bison are. So it's just, I just wanted to share that because I, I think that's something that's unique to Montana. I mean, we have places where you can drive 52 miles on a 50 miles on a gravel road, one way. We're not talking like in and out, just one way to get to one of our des our destination today. We do lease a lot of our ground to cattle ranchers. For, and for, for grass. Grazing. Yeah, yep. for grazing. And that's something I think a lot of people aren't aware of is um, there's far more cows on American Prairie property than there are bison. You know, to put it in perspective, we've got a herd of about 800 buffalo and the numbers gone down with the drought in the recent years, but our producers that we lease to run somewhere around 9,000 head. And of we, cattle. And we, yep, yeah, of cattle. And we lease to, I think it's about a dozen uh, cattle ranchers. These are different. These yep. are like the prairie dog town. Yep. Which They're looking ranchers for. really love. <laughs> yeah. Not, not so much. Those big holes and, and dirt mounds don't do well with, with farming and ranching, that's for sure. So with Prairie Dog Towns comes this like plethora of species that are dependent on kind of the environment that prairie dogs provide and burring owls are a very charismatic popular one of those species. So they're these little owls that can't dig their own burrows but require them um, 
as habitat to breed in, so they raise their chicks in them. So they'll kick out or find abandoned prairie dog um, holes and they'll, they'll raise their chicks in prairie dog towns. This is your lodge here? Yeah, this is our Enrico Education and Science Center. Hey yeah. Trinity, I'm Dan. How are you doing? How's Dan? it been? Yeah. Good. So Good. what's your part in managing I, of the bison in the prairie? And I am the Senior Wildlife Restoration Manager for American Prairie. Um, been with the organization for about five and a half years. My job is all centered around rewilding American Prairie, bringing back wildlife abundance. That includes bison, but bison is mostly handled by our bison team, and our director of bison restoration is Scott Heiderbrink. But uh, yeah, we're closely with that team as well. But yeah, bringing back all the wildlife in meaningful abundance, including including bison. Everything from bison and elk, bighorn sheep, the large carnivores that are missing, wolves and grizzly bears, things like prairie dogs, which it looks like you guys stopped to take a look at on the way in, and uh, getting you know black-footed ferrets back on the landscape at some point, swift fox, that sort of thing. Concerned a lot about uh, uh, grassland bird diversity as well, and the decline of grassland bird populations, but that, that work has is a bit different in nature since those, those birds spend half their time in South America or in uh, uh, Mexico or Texas, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so you can't really control the whole environment of those birds, what you're saying. It's, they, unlike the mammals, which yeah. are, you know, kind of in and around yeah. the area. They might the migrate a little bit, but yeah, they're around yeah, here. Yeah, the yes. birds migrate, they're like out of the country, so yes, it's a little exactly. hard to... Right. They're going to the that. southern Great Plains. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been the other half of the year, yeah. So do you hunt? I wouldn't call myself a hunter. I'm pretty bad at it, but yes. <laughs> well, I'm not good at it either, but <laughs> I just wanted to be, my viewers to know if you're kind of... Because um, the people that... You I'm a lazy trust. hunter, but yes, yes, I'm a hunter. But you'll hunt, so it's not, uh, you know, this is being managed for wildlife in a different way than just, like, protect it's, everything. It's not uh, a national park, no. Yeah. i got a freezer full of bison next door right now, which I'm happily eating off of and will be for a while to come. Uh, it's more of when it comes to elk, I'd rather help somebody else, help my buddy hunt and pack it out. It's less stressful than actually having to be the one with the permit, you know what I mean? I can't, I, it's too stressful for me. It's too much... Especially, too much on the line. I want somebody else to do that, and I'm just happy to yes. go on a backpacking trip. You know what I mean? Especially spe special permit stuff. Yeah. You know, it's like pressure. It's it's and once it's you draw work, one, it's you're like, like studying the like the regs, and I'm like, oh, yeah, just somebody else do all that, and then invite me along. I'll help you pack it out. Send me home with a quarter. That's 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 how I like to hunt. You know what I mean? Gotcha. As a porter, yeah. We're looking at what are we looking at here? Okay, so we're looking basically at a map of American Prairie. We came down here from Lewistown. We went up. 191 um, all the way to Dry Fork and then now we're right here on Sun Prairie. So this gives you an idea when we talk about it being such a big ambitious project. What's, what's the blue? Uh, blue is deeded so that's private property okay. and then uh, lighter blue is the leased public land. Okay and then this is the CM, this is the wildlife refuge. Yep yep and then over here is the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. Okay. Um, so you can see that we go all the way over here to the PN, which is north of Winifred. That's a really cool old um, historic area. It's beautiful in the breaks. Um, and then we extend <laughs> all the way over to the east uh, with Timber Creek. Um, and, you know, if you keep going further east, that's where you get to, to Glasgow. Okay. We're still always from there, but um, our latest acquisition is uh, the wild horse unit, and it's small compared, relative, uh, compared to some of our other properties. But what's exciting is now this is the first time we are officially fence line neighbors with the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. Great. So what is the what is the goal here with the land purchasing? What, what, are, you, what are they trying to accomplish? If right. Because right, you can see that it's it's you know it's um, there are pockets here and pockets here, and the idea is to take an area which has a lot of existing public land and buy up the private lands to interconnect them. So the white on the map, that all represents privately owned land. The brown is BLM and state public land. Um, and our goal in trying to build a 3.2 million acre reserve is to just connect enough pieces of private land with existing public land to create a place for wildlife to roam more freely. So trying to connect the the BLM to other BLM. Yep. So these areas in between. Yep. So that wildlife can 
roam more the way it used to. Yep. Is that yeah, that's fair. Originally? Yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and also we're creating public access for people. We want to make sure that that's, uh, public access is a corner, cornerstone of our mission. And so unlike other large landowners, and we've seen a lot of them, especially in the recent years with COVID and everything, moving into Montana and purchasing up land and then locking it up and keeping it private. So when we buy property, you know, the dark blue that you see on here that's private, deeded, it's open to the public. So we're just trying to make sure that, um, you know, we're preserving this area not only for wildlife, but also for people. And I think that's something that's very important for people to understand is that, that they can come access this ground. Yep. It's it's kind of, in a way, like the BLM, in meaning you can access this property, whereas a lot of times these things don't have access for the public. That's right. So. A uh, huge benefit there. So whether you're, you know, hunting, hiking, camping, biking, fishing, <laughs> you know, you name it, stargazing, um, wildlife watching, there's a lot that you can come out and do out here. Yeah, here's an old bison collar. You can feel just how heavy this is, because this is where the, the GPS powered tracker would be. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So how'd you like to wear that? Pretty good weight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some good jewelry to wear around your neck yeah. in the hot summer. Um, so we transitioned from do, from bees to, you know, little ear tags, much like a cow would wear. It's just a, that's like a hundred grams or less in weight and more reliable. More reliable to access to, you know, for from the data. Yeah. yeah. We're headed out now to go see some of the buffalo on uh, one of the American Prairie properties, which is again, Sun Prairie gotta get that right because i tend to say sun river for everything no. um but you were talking about neighbors and i see there's ranches as neighbors around here so how how is it to deal with your neighbors um and i the reason i ask that is because a lot of times ranchers don't like to change things right what you're doing right here i see you're not raising buffalo for the purpose of like capacity you're not you're not trying to uh, hold the capacity of buffalo on the property that it could if you we're operate not, we're not it like a bison. ranch. We're not ranching bison. Yes. We're not selling them for me. So that tends to, you, you're you going to have some conflict with what they believe you should be doing and what you guys believe you should be doing. So how, how do you deal with that and what, I mean, what's the reception of ranchers and stuff? I don't like putting good, words better. in other people's mouths, but I mean, I think it's just about being a good neighbor. You know what I mean? We, 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 we mind our fences and take care of the land and, you know, do you yeah, actually mind your problem. fences? That's like 90, that's better than 90% of any neighbors in ranching. <laughs> right there, guys, that covers it, right? We don't, we just shut the camera off. They take care of their fences. Amazing. Fence, fencing diplomacy, right? No, exactly. no we, we, we need to for many reasons, not least of which is just the good neighbor policy, making sure that our fences are in tip top shape and they're uh, doing what they're supposed to in terms of holding bison. And in our case, they're usually wildlife for what they are, a wildlife friendly design as well. So not only containing bison, but being mostly permeable to just about everything else. Okay, well, this might be only interesting to me or the ranchers, but I was gonna have him show him, show us what kind of a fence actually keeps in buffalo because buffalo are, you know, people have this view of like the only thing that will keep in a buffalo is like a concrete barrier. Yeah, right. right? 10 foot, yeah, prison fence. Yeah. No, it's not the case. That's not what we found. This is our exterior fence design. We basically just took Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks wildlife friendly fence design and said, let's use that because we, we, we need to keep the bison in, but we also have a vested interest in making sure that the fences are not an undue barrier to wildlife like pronghorn. The only difference is we add this hot wire here at 30 inches off the ground, second wire from the top. That is an electrified wire, a higher tensile um, single strand wire, and it is electrified. And that's just a lit, that's just enough extra that we think it really helps keep, it, it does keep help keep the bison in. You put, a, you put a hot wire right about at nose height for an animal like that, and it's just a, a and, and incentive that, not to mess with the fence or test. Yeah. Exactly, so is that electrified uh, we're talking about the same amount as so the, the cow fence, the like a cow electric right fence, or is a little bit more. I forget the voltage off the top of my head. You'd have yeah. to you'd have to check with somebody else. But I mean, it, it packs a punch. You, yeah. you know, you don't I mean, want to. It's 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 more than a suggestion. It's, right. It 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 it, it, uh, it it'll mess up your morning if you run into that. Yeah. So there's the the buffalo herd right there, or a herd. This, how many is in here? 
there's about 400 animals on this unit and we're looking i mean if you if you subtract out the bulls um because the bulls in the bite it's it's not like a ranch in that way all the all the animals are in the pasture together all year long the bulls won't be here except the very young bulls that are still with their moms and their aunties so like this is probably the vast majority of that cow calf herd <laughs> system being having some hunting involved in keeping the the amount of buffalo on the property to the level you're targeting right and but uh, I was talking with Katie earlier and she was mentioning that the the hunting is actually for two-year-old bulls can you let just kind of talk about that a little bit what what did you allow to, to be hunted and how yeah so I mean it varies from year to year and it's basically based on our management needs typically what we've allowed in the last few years, and this is pretty new. We've only been doing the harvest program for five or six years now or something like that. So it's still kind of a new idea we're still kind of playing around with. But basically by removing younger animals, whether they're bulls or cows, but kind of like two and under, three and under, that sort of thing, you're largely replicating the kind of depredation that we would see in a natural in a natural system, right? So like in a place where you had wolves and grizzly bears, we don't, but in a system like that, it's generally the younger animals that are more susceptible to that depredation. So you're kind of mimicking that with your harvest program. Also, because we're kind of still just getting started and bison are fairly long lived, our herd tended to be younger. So we didn't have that many old animals and we had, we're making a lot of new young animals every year. So in terms of keeping a kind of well-rounded, even sex and age ratio, a good distribution of the population, it makes more sense to harvest the young ones. We're getting to a point now where that we have, the, the herd is getting older or that age, um, that age distribution is spreading out. So we have a lot of young animals, but we're also increasingly having more and more old animals. So we're getting to a point where we think we can allow harvest opportunities for, for older animals as well, and not just the younger ones. But it's a decision that we make every single year. Sometimes we'll say just males, three and under. Sometimes we'll say either sex, two and under. We do that year to year, just based on what our management needs are. So there is some big bull opportunities if uh, just on a limited basis sometimes. Yeah. So this year we are, this is the first year where we have two opportunities that went out for uh, any age, any sex animals. So we don't like think of it like a trophy opportunity per se. People can no. shoot whatever they want right. if they have those access permits, right? Um, but that in, that would include, you know, a, a big bull if that's what they choose to shoot. If you're the if best. your goal is to have something tasty in the freezer, you, you probably want to shoot two and under um, for sure. Beyond that, they start to get a little time. I mean, it's still it's still good meat, it's still good lean meat. But like if, you're, if your primary objective is to have like the tastiest stuff in the freezer, yeah, two and under is probably what you want to shoot. What is your goals and objectives for the prairie? And are the bison and buffalo like the only part of this or is it? No. No, I mean, it's, so it's, it's holistic ecological restoration. It's everything. We do a lot of work with bison because bison are a very important species. They're what we think of as an ecosystem engineer. And so they do a lot of the kind of restoration work for us. They also happen to be considered livestock in this part of Montana, which means we can own bison, unlike all other wildlife. So the project often is associated with bison because we do a lot with bison. We, 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 we own a lot of bison. We manage a lot of bison. We saw the fences. We built fences for bison to keep them in. But the project is about bringing back all of the wildlife. And I don't, it's not so much about looking backwards. Like it's not like, it's not like there's some date and time where it's like all the way Lewis and Clark saw it or like all the way it looked at the closing of the open ranger. And it's not, it's really, it's, I don't see it as it going backward, but more about like having an ecosystem that has that is regulated by its own processes so essentially what i mean by that is like a, a fully functioning ecosystem needs a lot of wildlife in it to be resilient and to have those kind of natural ecological processes that we processes we would expect one of the things that people a lot of people that i deal with 
think about or they don't think about is the fact that this is actual prairie in the American West. Yes. When they think of Montana, they don't necessarily think of this. They think of forest, mountains, you know, things like that. When I show them a piece of prairie, they're like, what happened to all the trees? Yeah. So, I mean, talk about it. This is, this has never had trees. No, I mean, timber. no, 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 no. I, well, over no, there, we what you can see, like along the creeks, you know, you find the cottonwoods and the box elders. That's natural. In fact, there probably was a lot more of that historically than what you see today, because a lot of that area is degraded. And if you get all the way into the breaks, we can't see it from here, but down into the CMR, into the Missouri River breaks, you get those ponderosas and junipers. That's natural. But out here where we're standing in this like high country, basically away from those riparian areas, there shouldn't be trees here. If there were trees here, it would be a problem. We don't get the kind of like tree invasion as much as they get down in like Oklahoma and stuff. Thankfully, that's not as much of a threat in our prairie. It's just very dry out here. So it's hard for those trees to even get established. But no, this is prairie. Always has been and hopefully always will be. Yeah. So we were talking about that on the way out here. But um, a lot of people think more trees is always the answer. Yeah. Always right. more. And so out here, even where, where I'm at in the western part of the state, right. we have the invasion of the yeah. trees, which... Right takes over the vat is trying to is tried tries to take over the valleys and the grasslands but really there isn't enough water to sustain those trees so what that's why you have such a high burn rate when you yes. burn everything off and then you get a, a million trees growing up in an area that only had a few right then then they're sucking up all the water and they're drying out so they're like dry tinder yeah and then you just have this fuel system that just doesn't work very well and you end up with a lot of other damage right I, I'm, I'm just on this kick right now of, of explaining to people how when you're trying to save one thing or you yeah. think that one, everything or one principle applies to every land, right? Right. right. It doesn't work. Yep. In fact, you end up hurting other things mm -hmm. and the environment right. when you do that. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to bring that up because taking care of the prairie is a completely different ecosystem, but you're managing it for what the prairie can sustain and what it, what it does. Yes. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, you, you, I mean, you described ecology in a nutshell, right? I mean, like, you got to think of everything as interconnected. And in addition to that interconnectivity, we think a lot about um, dynamism, right? So basically the idea that, like, things change, and that's natural to the system. Like, some years are wet, some years are dry. Drought is endemic, built into the system out here, right? Mm -hmm. um, historically, you would have had other big disturbances like fire, or even big, you know, things like prairie dog towns are a kind of disturbance that creates heterogeneity or diversity on the landscape that, that is important for all kinds of biodiversity. The woody encroachment you're talking, what we would call woody encroachment, this idea of like trees moving into the prairie, that idea is, again, it's not, it's a, it's too dry here oftentimes for the trees to even get started. But in other parts of the Great Plains, you know, historically you would have had a fire return cycle probably every 20 to 30 years and a large ungulate like a bison, well, a bison in, in our case, that, that is actually mechanically like knocking down trees. They like to rub on stuff. Anything that's out here that's standing up, they will go itch on. So, I mean, trees don't have a chance between the fire and the bison, but you remove the bison from the landscape and you mitigate fire as much as possible. You've created an opportunity for those trees to start moving in. And so the, e like, the trees will take over, but the ecosystem has these built-in processes for keeping prairies prairies. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we, that's, what, that's part of what I mean about putting back the component pieces right like with all of its stuff with some amount of burning with a large you know uh, indigenous grazer something like a bison the prairie has a better chance of kind of defending itself keeping itself going we saw a, a group of four bulls coming in they were all by yeah. themselves yeah, yeah 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 older bulls they'll tend to separate themselves off from the herd as a bachelor group because they don't want to move around with the herd they don't want to do what the herd does and it's kind of like when they get to a certain age they're actually just kind of old cranky men <laughs> they don't want to do anything you know before back before the cattle days when the original hunters were here and the uh, the trappers came through these areas i mean you can just imagine the seeing teepees in these valleys it, it's just incredible to be here and and see this especially with the buffalo there and this is this is publicly open so you can come see this too i'll tell you what there's something very fulfilling about being able to see it again in in a modern form of what used to be you can see the storm rolling over the prairie there and then you can come right over here and those four bulls are right over there on that hillside. Probably 
150 yards away from me. One of them's rolling. Kind of dust bathing himself. It, it's 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 a pretty unique experience. Even though I know a lot of ranchers will look at something like this and say, "Oh man, you you know you you're competing with us and you're taking away land for ranching," and it, it's you know there's a lot of problems with maybe the clashing of cultures here. But some of this does need to be maintained in a preserve way. Just like some of Africa needs to be maintained in a preserved way. So that we can see it and experience it. It's, it's almost a fulfilling thing to your soul. So this is pretty cool. Really, really cool. Fantastic experience. I'm glad I came out here. I can just picture sitting on this hillside right here in Dances with Wolves, watching these buffalo across the way. These are the prairies that were basically like an American Serengeti at one time, covered with these animals and, and along with wolves and tons more pronghorn antelope and tons more mule deer and they're a completely different place. Just hearing about some research the other day though that like grasshoppers are much more prevalent where there's cattle or bison grazing than there are in like the CMR where you don't have a large grazer. So like we think that it's like oh the grasshoppers just want to be where like you know if you think about them as competing for resources you'd expect there to be more grasshoppers where there's nothing else to compete with like no so, large grazer. So there's no kind of there's no large grazer in the CMR? Mm, I thought most there was... of it. A lot of those uh, grazing allotments have been retired over the years. Like CMR is kind of moving away from cattle grazing on the CMR. There are still some active allotments in there, but over the 1.1 million acres, very few. I thought there was bu buffalo on the There CMR. are no buffalo on the CMR. No buffalo on there. Oh, okay. On the prairie, you're gonna have wind. And I know a lot <laughs> of people are used to, when, they, when you're loose, used to living in the back east or in a timbered area all the time, it blocks most of your winds. So you get out west here and the air currents can just flow. And in fact, when you get near mountains, they create their own wind, but out here in the prairie, it, it blows yeah. a lot. So you gotta be prepared for that. And, and especially in a, like a tent. Yeah, oh yeah. Wind can really affect you in a tent. So we were talking about, there's a lot of uh, different opinions about how grassland or rangeland is utilized and we're talking about the differences between like a rancher using this ground and American Prairie using this ground and you're never gonna have like like a place where everybody agrees on how to use something I mean some people are like well just let everything graze forever you know and never interfere because humans are the problem and and then others are like we need to manage it just like you would for cattle that way you create food production, that kind of thing. So uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on this first? I mean, on how how is American Prairie thinking about utilizing grazing as far as the grass? And what are they what are they thinking that we're using this American Prairie land for? Are you using it for yeah. a wilderness area? Are you using it for food production? What, what is the goal? I think to speak the language that maybe a lot of your viewers are more familiar with like what American Prairie makes. What we do is we make nature. We make bison, we make wild, not wilderness, wild spaces for people to come and enjoy, whether it's to go bird watching or camping or go mountain biking or to come paint or to come see the night sky, yada, yada, et cetera, et cetera, right? We make natural resources for the enjoyment of everybody. That That's, I, I mean, I don't typically think of it. <laughs> Man, we're getting hurt. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't typically think there. of it that way, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, that, that is a correct way to understand what the project does. And so we don't make bison in, as a commodity in terms of a food resource, right? We're not a ranch that way. There are bison ranches, obviously. You can find them all over Montana, right? Absolutely. We're not a bison ranch in the sense that we're making that as a food product, although we do have harvest opportunities for bison, but that feels more like a hunt, right? That's more like going to get an elk than it is going to the grocery store to get a steak, right? 
So do you, do, when you manage these, do you, I see they have ear tags. How, uh -huh. how often do they get run in? We typically end up handling those animals, which means they go through the, the handling facility or corral um, about every two years. It's not like clockwork, but about every two years. Oftentimes we're doing that because like we need to like, get, we're, we're sending animals to other conservation herds or we're sending them to other management units. So we are, we're really only corralling them when we need to put some number of them on a truck. It's about it. We try to like not handle them besides that. Yeah, it's about it. We, we end up handling about every year, but from the bison's perspective, it's about every two years, right? Because we'll like alternate where we do the handling. Gotcha. And then, so how do you, how do you get the buffalo into a corral? <laughs> you you hope that the, 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 the weather and the grass co cooperate. When it's dry out here and droughty, it's a lot easier to bait them into the corrals. Um, you know, you've got, we've got like a yeah, kind of a funnel system, right? You've got the corral system itself, and then there's a big pen and a bigger pen and a bigger pen and a bigger pen. And so you're trying to get them into the top end of the funnel there, right? Um, and generally we do that in the fall into the winter. So if, you know, things are dried up, things are pretty eaten out, um, by that point you, you can bait them in. But some years, you know, the grass is still growing and it's like, we, we have to be, we have to get out there with the ATVs or something like that and do a little bit more coaxing them in, especially if we're trying to get every single animal into the facility and just, and not just a subset. I don't think there's ever been a preserve like this on the prairie yet. No, when we were making parks, national parks in this country, we did a pretty good job of conserving rock and ice and glaciers and geysers and stuff like that. And we kind of overlooked the Great Plains. This is actually one of the first areas that was called for as a nation's park way back in 1830 by George Catlin was like, hey, look at all these wild animals and stuff and all these people running around. Like we should preserve this as some kind of America's park. And of course we didn't do that. But it right. means that there's very little grasslands in that kind of conservation um, anywhere in the world, let alone in the, in the United States. Speaking of habitat. Yeah. Um, I, I was down in the Prior Mountains at the Wild Horse Range, and mm -hmm. people have a, a tough time understanding. They just say, well, let the wild horses run. Right. And, well, and I don't think that's really an answer because you can't just let anything run without being managed to some extent. Um, we were talking about the prairie back in the day, you know, 150 years ago or whatever, still being managed by humans. Yes. Um, so what are your thoughts on horses and management of a any animal on the prairie and why we would do that uh respectfully because i know horses mean a lot to a lot of people indigenous and non-indigenous people that is an important cultural species as an ecologist horses have not are originally evolved in north america a long long time ago like thousands and thousands tens of thousands of years ago but then they left the continent at the end of the last ice age they all ended up in europe and asia which is where we think of horses being today we were brought back in by the Spanish in the 1700s, and then they got loose and they wandered and they became wild again. Basically, the ecosystem as it exists today, the last time there were horses in North America, wild, true wild horses, you had things like long-legged hyenas and cheetahs and all these weird, crazy, huge carnivores we don't have anymore that were managing those populations, right? The same way wolves and grizzly bears manage bison populations or elk populations. And so in a modern context, the concern amongst a lot of conservationists is there's nothing to regulate those horse populations, right? There's no top-down pressure. Like, it's not the horse's fault that they overgraze, but naturally there would be something keeping those populations in check. And without that something, horses can be very destructive. Elk can be very destructive if there's not enough, you know, whatever is keeping their numbers in check. So that's the concern about horses on rangeland like this. And that's why horses are not part of the American prairie model. Like we're like looking at the ecosystem as it's existed for like roughly the last 10,000 years since the last ice age. And in that time period, you don't have wild horses. Yeah. And I, so now I think horses may have a place in nostalgia. So, so these small areas that we have wild horses, I think that's good, but you, yes. but the only manager of them, because there are no, is humans that's and right. you have that's to right. manage them that's to right. keep them from destroying. This ecosystem would not look like this if you completely overgrazed it with anything. That's correct. Yeah, right. You're right. damaging right. not only the, the animal itself, but also the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. You know, I do feel that this it has a place and doing it this way, it, this could be a model for not, you can't cover it all, but a model for other things where people can actually enjoy it, but it's not run by government and your tax dollars, right? This is not a national park. This will never be a national park. I like the national parks. I grew up going to national parks with my family. Mm -hmm. This is a different model of conservation. In a large part, this is an answer to the national parks to say that like 
regardless of how you feel about the parks. There's another, there's other ways to do conservation, and maybe we should think about that. So American Prairie is privately funded. It comes from donor support. Very, very little money of ours comes from like federal grants or certainly not federal subsidies, that sort of thing. We pay taxes on our bison, the same way a livestock producer pays taxes on their cattle. We actually pay more per head in terms of a livestock tax for bison. But going back to what you're saying, it's important to remember that of the three point, like the big American prairie, the eventual goal is that 5,000 square miles, right? The vast majority of that will be public land, whether it's the 1.1 million acre Charlie Russell National right, Wildlife Refuge, mm -hmm. or like even on this property, right? Like anywhere from probably 70, 80% of the land base is Bureau of Land Management land. So that is public land, right? Like we're just buying up the private land like there's, we're standing on right now that comes with grazing allotments on that public land. So the majority of the land is public already right now, but the land that we buy, the land that we own, we intend to own forever. This isn't it, like there's all this other federal and state and yada yada public land. We're saying, what if we took private lands and we manage them like a park in the sense that they're open to the public? It's private land, but you can come here 365 days a year. Anybody can come here 360. We want people to come and enjoy this and see this and see what we're doing and enjoy this. That's for everybody. But you can do that with private land. You don't just have to do that with a national park. Right, right. And that's one, one contention point between a lot of what I hear is that you're using public land, BLM land, in a way that ranchers aren't able to use it. So... Um, so like people, ranchers say, well, you're using, you've gotten permission to use BLM ground um, year round with no fences instead of how ranchers have to do it, which is on, you know, two months out of the year. So, so one of the things about this is, is if you believe like me in personal rights, the rights of a person, right, then I have to say that and this, this applies to the same thing as like, well, American Prairie is competing for land. They're buying land that ranchers can't afford because American Prairie is driving up the prices. I, I call baloney on that. Be, and I'm sorry, but I do because they don't dictate the price of anything. It's whatever somebody's willing to pay. That's what who buys the land. So just because American Prairie buys the land, I don't personally believe that, that the rancher who's making almost nothing is going to be able to afford it for their to add to their ranch. Now, in some extreme cases, that pulls something away from a family operation. Yeah, I hate to see that too. I've seen it all over, not just with American Prairie, but also the people that can afford this land other than American Prairie are affording it to, to make it into their private personal right. range that that nobody can access right. and and that is their right now would i rather have that land go to that or this definitely something like this where, where the public can enjoy it so that's my thoughts on that what are your no that's great thanks for saying so i mean yeah. i think like i appreciate i appreciate the clarification i would actually take it a step farther though because we are a non-profit there's actually like IRS laws about what we can pay for property above fair market value. Essentially, the short version is is we can't. So we've been outbid on properties before from ranchers, right? Because, I mean, a, a private citizen can pay whatever they want for the land if they can afford it. We can't. We could actually lose our nonprofit status if we're paying significantly above market value. So there are cases where, regardless of whether or not we actually have the money, we are just like not capable of doing a kind of free market purchase and saying we'll pay whatever we'll pay whatever it takes to get that property i think a lot of people think that's what we do and it's, it's just not the case it's not it's not a, something that we have the ability to do so we're not driving up prices in that way because oftentimes we we are just constrained we basically can only pay what the property is worth according to a third party appraiser um so that's important to remember in terms of thinking about competition the other thing that's important to remember is it's all willing selling willing seller willing buyer right like we're basically only buying ranches that are for sale that's mm -hmm. it no interest or ability to push people off. A lot of these neighbors are good, hardworking people that care. They might not use the word conservation, and I don't mean to put words in people's mouths, but they are doing a real good job in terms of sustainability and keeping their family afloat and doing what they want to do. I don't want those people to leave. I want I want there to be more ranchers like those people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, like those are those are good neighbors. I, in, in my mind, we're all working towards the same thing, right? But if there's a ranch that comes up for sale, if somebody has decided 
for whatever reason, that this isn't for them or there's nobody to pass it on to, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we're interested in taking that property and, and making it work for conservation. And and it's it's just like the same it's the same thing with with uh, anything though what what somebody's willing to pay is the price that the land is worth. So right. if that price is way out of what a rancher can pay, it's the same thing as we're dealing with like in the last two years in Montana for housing. Yeah. People are moving here that have enough money to drive the price up because it's not really driving the price up they're willing to pay more than anybody in montana is willing to pay or most people in montana are willing to pay that's just the way the world works that's the right of somebody that has more income so you have the right to not sell your property you have the right to buy something if you have enough money it's very uh difficult when you start getting into well somebody else has more money than me so it's not fair that they get to buy it and i can't that's not a free market you know, holding something so you're like no i can only you can only sell property to this person right. for this price that's not a free market that's not freedom like i believe in the united states so i don't want to see land i don't want to see this all this go under development and go under you know uh, my big thing is like big electrical turbines and stuff like that i don't want to see that so there there has to be ways to do it number one that i believe in is keeping family ranches afloat by giving them a way to make enough money to where they don't sell their ranch in the first place. Now that, that doesn't always happen, but that is one way. Another way is what you're doing. This preserves the land as well, even though it might be in a way that some people don't agree with. If you don't do those things, then you end up with, with this land being lost to something that we can't repair it from. Yeah. And, and then, then you're done. So, I know it's hard for some people, but you ha when I when you believe in personal rights, like the personal freedom, I would say more than personal rights, the freedom of the individual is what America is based on. When you believe in that, then you have to say if somebody's willing to pay a certain amount, that's the an that's that's what it's going to sell for. If you want to change that, then you have to change the process or the ability for somebody to make enough money on it to where it doesn't sell. And 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 those are your options. Otherwise. Uh, otherwise, you have big government stepping in saying, you can't buy this, you can buy that, somebody else can pay this, whatever. And I don't agree with that, so. Man, I appreciate it. It was a fantastic conversation. I know we ran yeah. out of battery there and had to finish it here. <laughs> but it works. Yeah, so it was really good to meet you. Pleasure. Man. Pleasure, yeah. Thanks good for talking time. to you, talking over a lot of the issues and kind of getting to know what you're doing and how you're doing it out here. Fantastic. Come back and see us sometime. we Will do. Well, I had such a fantastic time out on the APR, the American Prairie Reserve, and I learned so many things that I didn't know before. And one of them, the one of the things that I want to really emphasize, if you're still here on this video, is that the public can access any of the APR's land just like they can public ground. So for the public, it's a massive win. You can camp, you can bird watch, you can hunt, you can fish. You can explore all the things that you want to do on public ground. You can do on all of American Prairie's ground. Now, the other thing I want you to keep in mind is, and I'll be covering this as we go through this week and the next couple weeks, is that the amount of grass and land is finite, meaning there's only so much of it. So you have to consider when you look at these things, the reason there's so much controversy is you have land that's producing ag, which means it's producing food for the world, the country and the world, uh, through raising cattle from ranchers. And now you're taking that public land and you're putting it into a different use. You're, you're using that public land now for a reserve, which benefits the public greatly as far as being able to go out and experience something. I would argue it probably enables it to create an environment, an ecosystem that is going to save and preserve a lot of species that in other words, in other ways wouldn't be preserved. They're just like prairie dogs don't do well with ranching and farming. It's not, it's just not something that fits together well with it because they're, you're creating holes for things to step in. You're, you're messing up swathers, equipment, and things like that that just don't do well with that kind of thing. So in a reserve, uh, you can have that diversity that you maybe can't have on a ranch. So there's a lot of this, there's intricacies all over the place about how this works and might, might work and might not work 
in the future. And one of those is how they're going to change the use of that BLM. And I'll have a few segments on that during this week and the next week. Uh, so keep in mind, subscribe to this channel, follow me on Life in the West in on uh, Facebook as well, because these segments are going to be there and over here so that you can see the rest of this story, uh, the, the stuff that didn't fit into this one video. I met, a, like I said, I met a, great, a lot of great people, had a great time, really learned a ton. Hopefully you did too. So that's it for this episode. Until next time, God bless.